I'm thrilled to be with you today. Maybe not here right now, but to be back on campus with you today. Today we acknowledge some incredible accomplishments from our faculty colleagues who are representative of so many of you who are equally deserving colleagues. Taking time out of our busy preparations for classes to look around and appreciate the efforts of those who are working beside us is worth taking some time to do on occasion. In like manner, I feel a strong tug to express my sincere appreciation to those who have worked with conviction to help in preparing for fall semester. Today, I want to express appreciation to each of the councils that I have been a part of during this year of bumps and twists and turns. Our President's Council has met multiple times each week to organize 19 committees to prepare for this upcoming fall semester. In these meetings, colleagues have shown collegiality, warmth, patience, and perseverance. I continue to be humbled to be part of this group of devoted individuals. The Academic Vice President's Council has met nearly as often as President's Council, with each member leading out in important ways on one or more of our planning committees in preparation for fall semester. I am grateful for the support, friendship, and collegiality that we have shared as we have juggled the ups and downs of fall semester preparations. I am also grateful for your deans. At each step in our planning, your deans carried much of the water in fall planning, participating on one or more of our committees to address the needs of the semester and taking the task of working closely with our amazing campus schedulers to create a schedule in world record pace. President M. Russell Ballard, the master architect of councils in the church, spoke of councils and with a bit of substitution from me, he said, we each have large individual responsibilities, but just as important is the responsibility we share with others to come together in council in a united effort to solve problems and bless all of our students. When we act in a united effort, we create synergism, which is increased effectiveness or achievement as a result of combined action or cooperation, the result of which is greater than the sum of the individual parts. The ancient moralist Aesop used to illustrate the strength of synergism by holding up one stick and asking for a volunteer among his listeners who could break it. Of course, the volunteer was able to break one stick easily. Then Aesop would put together more sticks together until the volunteer was unable to break them. The moral to Aesop's demonstration was simple. Together we generate synergism, which makes us much stronger than when we stand alone, unquote. I am grateful for the strength and synergy built together with dedicated, wise, and loyal colleagues. While not mentioning, the, mentioning them by name, they are to a person, friends, mentors, and fellow disciples of Jesus Christ. As, as we have experienced this historic year, we pause today in our furious preparation for the start of fall semester that is unlike any other fall semester in the history of the university to consider opportunities we face in the upcoming year. As we gather in different places today, I'm reminded that we have a unique place in the ecosphere of higher education with a clear and deliberate alignment with our sponsoring institution, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, coupled with a firm commitment to student-centered teaching and scholarship. In this unique position, we have many advantage, advantages over colleagues at other universities. To name a few, we are generously supported by the Board of Trustees, which is chaired by the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Among the chairmen of the board are two former presidents of universities and the executive committee of the board is chaired by a former president of BYU. To suggest that our leadership understands the issues and demands of modern higher education is an understatement. I continue to be amazed at the wealth and breadth of knowledge that our leadership considers in decisions and that they care so deeply about our students' experience and the unique 
and importance of the mission of this university, including our faculty and their development. The board's approval of each faculty hire is a clear indication of the value that the board places on those who are tasked with providing role models and examples of disciples of Jesus Christ in our classrooms. In our current pandemic, I continue to be amazed and humbled and full of gratitude for the continued generous financial support from, the board, from our board of trustees and the tithe payers of the church. We were recently informed that the board of trustees has authorized a guideline salary increase for the next year. In a time when many universities are cutting budgets due to COVID-19, including faculty and staff salaries, our board of trustees continues to provide salary increases. Instead of furloughs, we experience raises. Instead of cuts, we experience modest increase. This is an incredible blessing and a generous expression of support by the leaders of our church. May we pause with gratitude and humility for it. In addition, I continue to be amazed at the yearly church appropriations to BYU for the purpose of educating Zion, which reach in the hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Indeed, we are blessed. We are experiencing unprecedented challenges. In fact, I've heard people say that we have used unprecedented, an unprecedented number of times. And as we face these unprecedented challenges as a university due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we look forward to a state of the world over time that was represented. If we, if we were to look at the state of the world over time as a smooth function with some ups and some downs, 2020 would be a discontinuity in the curve, a blip. Although the students arriving in 2020 are much like the students who first arrived during my first university conference, anxious, enthusiastic, and full of life, the students returning this fall have a very different set of anxieties and their enthusiasm and zeal for life present both opportunities and risks as we begin a new semester. Some will return to campus with fear and trepidation about the state of the world who will need reassurance and comfort. Others will return to campus with a sense of impenetrability and fearlessness that may need to be reminded of the importance of protecting others. One of our opportunities and challenges as a faculty will be to model, encourage, and support responsible behavior by wearing masks, practicing physical distancing, and making arrangements for students who become ill. The students gathering in our compact commun community this fall will indeed be like no other generation that has gathered on this campus. Reminiscing on the changes in generations at the BYU commencement exercises in 2018, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave a powerful address that provided a vision for the future of the students as they transitioned to a new phase of life. In his stunning address, Elder Holland expressed that he was counting on the graduates to be something more. I believe he was expressing an invitation to our entire campus community that is as pressing for us as faculty, as a university community today, as it was for the graduates in 2018. Let's watch. You leave BYU to enter a political, social, and economic world your parents never knew and your grandparents could never have dreamed of. Perhaps that's true of each succeeding generation in history. But in my old age, I could, for one, not have imagined as a BYU student more than half a century ago, the world you now go forth to experience. So much of that world is stunningly beautiful and rewarding. I do not agree that the best lack all conviction because you seated before me and a host of good people across the earth like you prove otherwise. I believe you to be the very best 
And I'm counting on you to be consumed with conviction. So go out there and light a candle. Be a ray of light. Be your best self and let your character shine. Cherish the gospel of Jesus Christ and live it. The world needs you and surely your Father in heaven needs you if his blessed purposes for his children are to prevail. You have entered to learn. Now go forth to serve and strengthen. If correcting all the world's ills seems a daunting task, so be it. Go out there and be undaunted. If we cannot look to you to change the world, tell me to whom we should look. Congratulations on your very significant achievement. May the sun always be at full noon for you, banishing every shadow that might otherwise mar your happiness. I express our pride in you and wish you Godspeed for the exciting journey you now undertake. Now that was powerful that he saw so much promise and hope and optimism for the future of each individual graduate brings me such courage and comfort. I see that same promise and hope and optimism for each faculty member as we begin this remarkably unusual fall semester. Elder Holland expressed that despite stark differences between the state of the world in times past and the state of the world right now, there is reason for us to take courage in the unique mission of BYU and the students it attracts. Has the need for laser focus ever been more needful than it is at this time, this pandemic stricken time? Our world is so fundamentally different than it was even a year ago. But did you hear the invitation that he gave to you and to me? After a stern rebuke of the poet W.B. Yeats when he said that he does not believe that the best lack all conviction, Elder Holland issues his fervent invitation. I'm counting on you to be consumed with conviction. As we begin the 2020 school year with all of its uncertainty and newness, may I invite us as a faculty to be great and to be consumed with conviction. My first job out of, Los, out of graduate school was at Los Alamos National Laboratory, working on the stockpile stewardship program in the nuclear weapons complex. It was intellectually stimulating work with many high pro profile visitors to the lab. Some of my early projects involved coordination with the Department of Energy political appointees assigned to the laboratory to learn about the science that was being conducted at the lab. The most compelling aspect of the visits from, the vis fr from these visitors was that our funding at Los Alamos was dependent on the congressional priorities and budgets. So these visits felt important with high stakes. About two years into my appointment at Los Alamos, we hosted a technical advisor to the DOE Undersecretary of the National Nuclear Security Administration. As we made our presentation of high quality work that represented years and years of combined work by our entire group and hours and hours of preparation, it became clear that our high-ranking and powerfully influential guest was not going to take back a positive report. I was crushed to know that the politics of the situation were going to win the day. As we were leaving our meeting and returning to our offices, I was expressing my disappointment to my group leader and mentor, Sally Keller. Sally has continued to be an important influence in my life. I still remember what she told me. She said, Shane, bury yourself in doing good science and the rest will take care of itself. She had invested her entire career in science and because she had consumed herself with it, her conviction for the science she'd consumed her career with would overwhelm all of the ancillary aspects of the job. Now, 
After one very eventful year as academic vice president, I have seen in our faculty at BYU a similar level of conviction and dedication as my mentor at Los Alamos taught me. One key difference, however, is that the conviction of our faculty is so multidimensional. Where she was laser focused on science, our faculty have multiple foci that make our experience richer and more fulfilling. In my experience, I have seen faculty demonstrate conviction for four separate things. The first is the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have conviction for the education of their students. They have conviction for contributing to their disciplines. And they have conviction for making our campus a welcoming place for all. It is about these four convictions that I want to address my remarks today. We are all familiar with the instruction from President Brigham Young to Carl Mazur that nothing should be taught on this campus without the influence of the Holy Ghost. He said, quote, you ought not to teach even the alphabet or the multiplication table without the Spirit of God. That is all. God bless you. Goodbye. The first aim of a BYU education is to provide for our students an education that is spiritually strengthening. That spiritual strengthening influence is guided by the Holy Ghost. In our AIMS document, we find that, quote, the founding charge of BYU is to teach every subject with the Spirit. It is not intended that all of the faculty should be categorically teaching religion constantly in their classes, but that every teacher in this institution would keep his subject matter bathed in the light and color of the restored gospel. This ideal arises from the common purpose of all education that at BYU to build testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. All students at BYU should be taught the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any education which is inadequate, is, any education is inadequate which does not emphasize that his is the only name given under heaven whereby mankind can be saved. Certainly, all relationships within the BYU community should reflect devout, a devout love of God and a loving, genuine concern for the welfare of our neighbor. Some disciplines on campus naturally lend themselves to bathing in the subject matter of the light and color of the restored gospel. Others may not. So what exactly does it mean to bathe our subjects in the light and color of the restored gospel? Recently, a collaboration between colleagues from, the, from religious education and life sciences explored how students in life sciences who wrestled with questions about faith and science could bathe scientific questions in the light and color of the restored gospel. It was an example of how the university community can work together to realize the aim of a BYU education to be st spiritually strengthening. Not every faculty member will be able to participate in this way, however. So what are some simple ways that we as a faculty can contribute to strengthening faith in the Savior and testimony of his restored gospel and claim our privilege of the entire faculty of the institution, whatever one's home, department, or college? May I humbly suggest that some simple ways include, first of all, how we conduct our lives. Our example has a powerful effect on strengthening faith in the Savior. As a student, I watched intently the examples of faculty members in my years at BYU and was grateful for the models of faithfulness and integrity shown by my professors. Second, sharing impressions from devotionals with students. It will be easier to share those impressions from devotionals as you watch or attend them. When you take advantage of the opportunity to watch or attend devotionals and forums and use small windows of time during classes to allow students to share impressions, spiritual strength will be built. Finally, praying at the beginning or opening of class to invite the Spirit. 
this has been something that's been part of my experience at BYU teaching in each of my classes. I sometimes have students pray in their mission languages. I have students fill out a card to share their willingness. I remember one such example of a student praying in class that was particularly memorable. She indicated on her card that she was willing to pray. She was clearly very shy and timid as she approached the front of the class to offer her prayer. And I remember vividly her fervent prayer. Please help Dr. Reese to actually make sense today. I hope that prayer was answered. These are mere suggestions for how we might make efforts to increase the spiritual strength of our students. You will be led to better ways of educating the whole person. We are entitled to the Lord's help in our work as faculty. As we are consumed with conviction for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will receive his help. We will be directed in ways that we might appropriately, organically, and meaningfully strengthen the faith of the students we teach. Second conviction for teaching. At no other time in my nearly 20 years at BYU has the faculty's conviction for teaching been on display as, it truly, as truly and remarkably as it was at the end of winter semester 2020. As has been mentioned earlier in President Worthen's remarks, on March 11, 2020, the university made a significant decision to take all courses from a standard delivery to remote delivery in a period of three days. Because you are so consumed with conviction for your students and their learning, you responded so magnificently. Without precedent, as our students faced a new reality of an empty campus with the announcement of an all remote delivery, each of you took the Herculean task of trading in your whiteboard markers and personal interactions for tools of technology and distanced instruction. When those students returned to class after those three unexpected spring break days, they saw on their computer screens in their dorms, their home bedrooms, or a vacant basement food storage room, a faculty member who might have been a world away. What students did not see was the fact that on the other end of that communication link was a faculty member who had turned her or his office into a virtual studio. They did not see the faculty members who were so brilliantly consumed with conviction for their students' learning that they eked out the remote delivery by adding in demonstrations and illustrations to bring the content to life. The students who only saw a Zoom screen did not have the benefit of seeing how consumed you all were with conviction for their education, that you found a way to accomplish this task while simultaneously juggling the demands of your own personal lives, which were also being dramatically impacted by the circumstances of the pandemic. One of my favorite images of the move from our regular way of teaching to an all remote delivery was the now familiar image of Professor of Dance, Nathan Balzer. In this photo, Professor Balzer is shown actively demonstrating a dance maneuver in what appears to be his kitchen. The conviction for his teaching is emanating from his facial expression. What is not often depicted in this compelling image is that while this image was indeed captured in his kitchen, Subsequent images show that Professor Balzer was also teaching while he was attending to his children. So many of you demonstrated in powerful and meaningful ways your conviction for our primary mission of educating young people, both in your home and at BYU. In reviewing the winter semester and all the preparations for fall semester, I am humbled to count myself among the faculty at Brigham Young University. You were all the frontline warriors tasked with the seemingly impossible and you responded with grace, skill, and incredible gifts. I am grateful to each one of you and every one of you. You have demonstrated so well and so clearly that you are consumed with conviction for the education of our students. Now conviction for scholarship. Modern higher education is nearly synonymous with what may be called by a variety of terms, writing to the academy, research or scholarship, creative works. 
In fact, faculty colleagues at other institutions, particularly Carnegie, Carnegie classified R1 institutions, are clearly consumed with conviction for their scholarship. So how do we at BYU reconcile the pull towards a conviction for scholarship with all of its value and benefit for society, its forwarding of our scholarly disciplines, as well as its promise for academic fame, fame and recognition? As has often been asserted on this campus, BYU is a primarily undergraduate teaching university, which places us in a unique category. Of this, President Worthen spoke when he said, quote, I believe that on these two issues, the compatibility of faith and learning and the compatibility of teaching and research, we at BYU are in the messy middle. We are clearly in the thinly populated middle position on these two matters because we reject both the dichotomy between faith and education as well as that between teaching and research. And our position is clearly messy, certainly messy in some ways, as we find ourselves straddling two divides that most believe are slipping further and further apart. But being in this precarious position should be reason for hope and not despair for being in the messy middle on these two issues makes us unique in ways that may allow us to achieve our prophetically declared destiny. As Brene Brown observed in a different context, the messy middle, the, the middle is messy, but it's also where the magic happens. Our partners in, unquote, our partners in education in Zion, BYU Idaho, BYU Hawaii, and Ensign College all have a clear mission and focus on teaching without the commitment to high quality scholarship. But ours is a different but related mission. As President Worthen describes it, a one of a kind mission. If we are to be consumed with conviction for our scholarship, we might realistically consider that with limited resources, there are several competing interests. For example, our clear charge to be student-centric in our teaching and scholarship will require careful consideration of what research topics will produce scholarship that is simultaneously student-centric and high quality. As a resolution to this tension between student-centeredness and high quality scholarship, perhaps it is our motivation for scholarship that makes it student-centered and something for which we can be consumed with conviction. Understanding the benefit for our students, pursuing research as a model for students in uncovering new knowledge and answering life's most perplexing questions. The pursuit of scholarship provides a unique opportunity for faculty to quite literally provide an example and how, and a model of how to, quote, meet personal cha challenge and change, and will also bring strength to others in the tasks of home and family life, social relationships, civic duty, and service to mankind. Perhaps not every project will fit neatly within the framework of modeling for our students, but I invite faculty in all disciplines to seek ways to model for students the process of discovery and obtaining answers to questions through serious inquiry and scholarship. In many cases, the students can be included directly as participants. I'm confident that as we incorporate students in being consumed with our conviction to scholarship, we will realize the vision of President Dallin H. Oaks, who asserted at BYU two years ago, inherent in being the University of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the reality that this great goal will not be attained in exactly the same way that other universities have achieved their greatness, close quote. When, when our scholarship is viewed through the student-centered lens of the modeling the discovery process for our students, either through direct involvement as in mentoring or simply by sharing with them the exhilaration of the process, we will naturally be driven to pursue higher quality scholarship. Our commitment for our scholarship and the process of discovery will show our students how to walk the path of being consumed with conviction and for using that same process to find answers in their lives. And lastly, a conviction for belonging. 
as faculty at BYU, we are consumed with a conviction for Jesus Christ, for their, our students and their experience, and for our scholarship. Today, I want to invite our entire university community, but most especially you, our faculty, to be consumed with conviction for all in our campus community, but specifically our campus community of color, to feel a sense of belonging at BYU. I want to share a bit of background as context for this invitation. In February, a panel discussion was held on campus where several black students and alumni were invited to share their experience with being black and immigrants. During that event, several hurtful and overtly racist comments and questions were, po were anonymously posted to a chat screen. These racist expressions left the participants on the panel feeling hurt, confused, and excluded from belonging to our BYU community. To be specific, and it pains me to have to recount some of these, but some examples included, quote, what is the percentage of African Americans on food stamps? And quote, why don't we have a white history month? These questions were racist and wrong at the time they were posted. And these questions are racist and wrong now. In response to this dreadful experience, in March of this year, President Worthen attended an event sponsored by our Multicultural Student Services that celebrates Black History Month. The event is called Perspectives. I encourage you all to attend. At the event, President Worthen shared an apology to our black students who were hurt by these truly awful comments and questions. Thank you, Ron. First thing I want to do is just thank those who have organized this event. I've attended enough to know that a lot of thought and work and sweat and probably prayers have gone into the preparation of each of the performances this evening. As I've attended the last few years, the Perspectives has become one of my favorite events on campus. The messages you'll hear this evening, the passion, the energy will be clear, evident, and powerful. And I want to thank Tendela, who personally delivered an invitation to attend on behalf of the group and grateful to her and to all of them for the preparation here. But I do want to just say a, a couple of things about events that have occurred in the, in the recent week. I'm grateful, first off, for the patience, for your patience as I've worked to understand fully the facts and the effects of some inappropriate, unfortunate, racist, and discriminatory actions that occurred and another event here on campus a week ago. It was unacceptable. The incident affected all the students at BYU, but it particularly affected the black, our black students who are here at BYU because the racist comments, concerns, and questions were directed at them. And I'm sorry that they experienced such pain. And I'm sorry that that kind of incident occurred on this campus and hope that it won't happen again. Now, what do we do? I've asked Academic Vice President Shane Reese and Assistant to the President for Student Success and Inclusion, Vern Hepry, to work with others to help us understand how we can have a more welcoming and understanding community and campus and environment for all our students. I'm not going to list everything that they have planned, but just know there are plans. Among other things, and I emphasize that, among other things, Vi Academic Vice President Reese will work with others to make sure that faculty members, as they prepare and address particular topics, are fully prepared, fully supportive, and ready to go. He and others will work with the faculty and others to help us better understand how we can address sensitive and important topics on our campus in a way that will stretch us out of our comfort zone, but ultimately give way for greater inclusion for all of our students. Among other things, Vern Hepry and the Office for Student Success and Inclusion will help us assess the current climate on campus with regard to diversity and inclusion and other related issues. They'll also work to help us identify and eliminate equity gaps among the various student populations here on campus, so that all of the students who come here, regardless of their background, will be able to take full advantage and fully benefit from the extraordinary and amazing education that's available at BYU. 
We'll enlist the aid of others on campus, including the faculty and deans, and I just want to give a shout out to Dean Ben Ogles of the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. He did an extraordinary job this past week with the students and faculty in that college to help them as they work through the events of this past week. Now, there is no quick, easy fix or solution to the challenges we face. It won't be resolved tonight. It could be part of it, but it won't happen just tonight. It will take a sustained effort by all of us if we're to reach the point, as the program says tonight, at which there truly are no more strangers among us. But we can do that. And we can do it in a way that's unique because of BYU and because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you again for being here. This is part of that process. But thanks again, even more thanks to the participants here who have spent their time so they can now share their messages and talents with us. May we, who are, who are watching these presentations, may we be changed, moved, uplifted, and changed, as I said, as a result of their sharing their gifts with us. Thank you very much and enjoy the program. As part of his conviction to belonging at BYU, President Worthen tasked me with helping our faculty understand how they might assist in creating an environment and culture at BYU that engenders belonging for our students of color, our black, indigenous, and people of color, our BIPOC. As part of that assignment, President Worthen recently asked me to form a committee of members of the broader university community, including faculty members, administrative and staff employees, and athletic professionals, to further understand the experiences of our BYU campus community BIPOC. In his initial charge to the committee, President Worthen described the formation and the work of this committee as historic. Recognizing the historic nature of its work, the committee rightly saw its first task of establishing a firm foundation for the work ahead by penning a statement of purpose. The governing principle for the work of the committee was a charge jointly issued by President Russell M. Nelson in conjunction with leaders of the NAACP who invited educational institutions to, quote, review processes, policies, and organizational attitudes regarding racism and root them out, quote, close quote. In response to this charge to BYU, the committee's mission statement asserts that to root out racism, it begins with understanding and living the two greatest commandments given to us by the master healer, Jesus Christ, to love God with all our hearts and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In this spirit of love, the committee will address racism, promote equity, and enhance belonging at BYU by listening to our beloved black community to understand how racism has frustrated and continues to frustrate their experience at BYU, inviting the input of all of our beloved black, indigenous, and people of color at BYU, as well as those committed to ridding BYU of racism through the establishment of racial equity and belonging, conducting a thorough quantitative and qualitative review of how processes, policies, practices, procedures, and operations and attitudes impact our BIPOC communities at BYU, identifying issues that negatively impact the prosperity of our BIPOC communities at BYU, drawing on the expertise of individual faculty and administrators within BYU to understand both the subtle and overt ways that racism may impact individual thought and interactions, organizational units, processes, policies, practices, and procedures and operations, creating prioritizing and presenting a comprehensive set of recommendations that will assist BYU to advance racial understanding, enhance equity and promote belonging and that we will have that, that will have a significant and enduring positive impact on the prosperity of, of our BIPOC communities at BYU. I am grateful to my colleagues on the committee who include law faculty Michael and Steele and Carl Hernandez III sociology faculty member Ryan Gabriel, director of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, Science, Sciences Committee on Diversity, Collaboration, and Inclusion, Lita Little Giddens, the director of the Multicultural Student Services Office, Mo Moises Aguirre, and women's track coach, Stephanie Perkins, 
Assistant to the President and Director of the Office of Student Success and Inclusion, Vern Hepri, and University Communications, John McBride. Each of these individuals has brought expertise, energy, and an incredible willingness to collaborate to the table. Their passion for change and desire to improve the experience of our BIPOC on campus is inspiring. I am humbled by each committee member being so consumed with conviction in assisting to root out racism at BYU so that every member of our BYU community might have life and have it more abundantly. The committee is actively meeting to consider recommendations that we will make to President Worthen near Thanksgiving. We have established a portal where all in the campus community can express experiences, ideas, and concerns. As part of the committee's listening, uh, we heard from students, present and former, who have not felt like they were welcomed or belonged at BYU. It has been at times simultaneously difficult and enlightening for me to hear and understand some of the painful experiences had by our students, faculty, and staff of color on campus. The connection between having life and having it more abundantly and our understanding of the second major goal, major educational goal of BYU that, quote, arts, letters, and sciences provide the core of an education which will help students think clearly, communicate effectively, understand important ideas in their own cultural tradition, as well as that of others, and establish clear standards of intellectual integrity. That statement is sometimes not experienced by our students of color. I am confident that the recommendations in preparation by the committee will contribute to meaningful changes so we can make BYU a place of belonging for all, but in particular for our campus community of color. In the meantime, may I humbly suggest that there are some small but meaningful actions that we can all take to make our campus community a place of belonging. President Russell M. Nelson shared three powerful suggestions for how we might accomplish the task ahead when he said, we need to foster faith in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Two, we need to foster a fundamental respect for the human dignity of every human soul, regardless of their color, creed, or cause. And three, we need to tireless, work tirelessly to build bridges of understanding rather than creating walls of segregation. Unquote. As further evidence of the need for belonging in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, an article entitled, quote, Mere Belonging, the Power of Social Connections, discusses the benefits of minimal social connectedness on performance motivation. The details of the study are fascinating, and this randomized controlled trial found that a person who felt even basic social connectedness caused that person to feel more confident and motivated to complete a task. In other words, relatively simple acts of kindness that express, I am connected to you, can yield measurable effects on a person's desire to succeed. Perhaps this is the scientific explanation of, what, of exactly what our students had in mind when they created a project called checkyourblindspot.org. I want to show you just one small segment of this student-led project. The basic need for social connectedness can be fulfilled with small and simple means, at least in part. It can start with a smile and a wave. How different would the student's experience in the video have been if just one student had smiled and pulled out a chair and said, come, sit here. 
May I invite all of us as faculty to make a personal conviction to create a sense of belonging in your sphere of influence. But how do we begin? It might begin in your classroom where your examples are more inclusive of black, indigenous, and peoples of color. It might be taking the opportunity to visit with a student who feels isolated and alone. It might be as you make your way from your office to your classroom that you deliberately focus on a warm smile and a greeting for one new person each day. This is something that every faculty member can do and can do now. If we are consumed with conviction for making our campus a place of belonging, we will take steps in the long journey to root out racism. I am humbled to count myself among you, the faculty at BYU. I am frequently in awe of your commitment to the university and its mission. Welcome back to a new semester. I am grateful you are here now at BYU. I see in you people who are consumed with conviction. Thank you. And I pray the Lord's choicest blessings for you as you begin this new semester in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.